Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's football at four. Yes, football at four and a half the hour Friday. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Right now over at InsideTheBirds.com. You can get the latest from Andrew DeCecco and Jeff Mosher after last night's game. And joining us right now, he says each and every Friday, as he's had all summer long, is Andrew DeCecco as he was at the game last night for an Eagles game that pretty much did not go as a lot of people expected it to go. But either way, I know DeCecco had some great analysis. If you followed him on Twitter, at A DeCecco NFL, he kept you updated all night long from Lincoln Financial Field. Andrew, how are you doing the day after probably the most ugly Eagles preseason game in a long time? <laughs> doing all right, Josh. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. You know, and listen, to me, and first let's start with this. If Jalen Hurts plays last night, Sirianni admitted that most of the starters would have played. So it's really hard to fully judge the offense when you know that the starting quarterback and the starting offensive line was not out there, correct? Correct. Those are things that need to be taken into account and not, you don't want to ever jump to a rash a judgment on what the team's going to look like or could look like because you have to take into account the pieces that were out there. A lot of these guys in a, in a dream scenario aren't going to be out there when the regular season unfolds in a few weeks. So um, yeah, there's some growing pains, no doubt about it, but you know, you really have to sift through it there, but there were a couple positive performances and certain players like Devontae Smith really benefited from getting his first NFL action. Let's get into Devontae Smith. You wrote about him extensively over inside the birds. You know, aside from the fact that guys like Chad Johnson were salivating over him over there on Twitter, uh, what was your perspective on him? Because it seemed like it took him a couple snaps to really warm back up and get back into it. But those two catches he had seemed to be completely on par with the reason why the Eagles drafted him when he got that separation those two times. Right, and I saw someone who was explosive off the line. You saw the route running savvy. Uh, the, he caught a couple balls, but you know, and, and the ones that he dropped, he didn't. When he spoke to us after the game, he didn't chalk that up to to rust. Although it certainly looked that way, he just said he needed. To, I guess I need to go to the judge machine a little bit more. But I mean, yeah, it was good to get his feet wet. Obviously, the the circumstances weren't ideal, but. He played 26 snaps last night. That was more than I thought he would play. And you got your first taste of NFL action. And hopefully, I don't know if that'll play next week, but hopefully he'll get that continuity with Jalen Hurts over the next few weeks so they can rekindle that uh, that old chemistry that they had dating back to their Alabama days in 2018. We heard Sirianni say during the week and then last night that he wants his receivers to get as much playing time as possible because he feels it's important for them to get the reps do you buy into that philosophy? Do you buy into what Sirianni is preaching about the receiver situation? Yeah, I think getting getting those reps is, is vital, especially when the group is so young. And obviously you'd like to have the quarterback back that's going to be taking said reps with these guys when the regular season unfolds uh, at Mercedes-Benz Stadium on September 12th. But, I mean, they've, nevertheless, they're running routes against NFL corners that aren't their teammates and they're getting, they're getting work and they're able to get critique when you get the film back as far as what they need to improve on um, different little subtleties and tendencies that, that go along with the position that they're able to really get the microscope on and make sure they're able to iron those things out when, when it becomes, when the game starts to matter. So I do think it does. It, it's very vital for, for the wide receivers to get these reps. One of the things I'm curious about, Andrew, is also your perspective. You mentioned the starting quarterback. Uh, You know, we weren't in the building like you were, so obviously there's a bit of a different vibe and environment when you're actually in the building covering a team. Uh, There were people who were trying to assert after the game uh, on social media and on television that, uh, you know, the Jalen Hurts uh, stomach infection, is what the Adam Schefter report says, was was all a ruse that the Eagles were all along going to bench their starters, even though Nick Sirianni said otherwise. What is your take on the whole uh, Jalen Hurts situation? Yeah, I don't, I'm not going to sit there and you know, create something that, that's not there or anything like that. I mean, I do think that it was legitimate. Uh, Jalen looked looked to be all right during pregame warm-ups. He was out there, he was fully suited, but Nick Sirianni explained extensively. It took a few questions 
to really get him to elaborate on the circumstance, but he definitely laid it out there and explained what transpired. You know, Jalen was hospitalized and evaluated for, for abdominal pains, in which he complained about after pregame warm-ups. I don't, there's nothing more, nothing less. There's just no, there's no conspiracy theories or anything like that. But those are things that you're going to start to see floating around on social media after that. But they, he did say, Nick Sirianni said that Jalen is all right. He's fine. So we'll see what happens. I don't know that you're going to see him next week, but you could argue that he needs to get at least a, at least a, a quarter. And because he's only played 10 snaps against the Steelers and he only played four games as a starter last season. So to kind of make that jump from 10 games uh, in early August to playing a full slate of uh, snaps against the Falcons in week one, I mean, that's a, uh, that's a pretty gradual jump. I mean, uh, you really need to get, you know, take a little bit of the next gradual, gradual steps and before you can make that, that big leap from um, preseason to the regular season. Andrew Checo joining us here at Football and Forward, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast at A the Checo NFL on Twitter. Check out all of his coverage of the Eagles over at InsideTheBirds.com. He's at the game last night. Andrew, let's go on the positives before we hit the negatives. Uh, starting offensively, obviously, you know, the, the two catches by Devonta Smith were what a lot of people were talking about. But the other thing I want to ask you about is I, I thought that we saw something interesting from the Eagles offensively, which was Kenneth Gainwell. I thought he had a very good game last night. I think you got to see in, in real time – why the Eagles drafted and why a lot of people think so highly of him. Right, and Kenny Gainwell was one of the few bright spots. There, you have, Like I said, you have to sift through it, but there were some positive plays and certain players that I thought really helped themselves. And Kenny Gainwell impressed me in the first game from a receiving standpoint, but he looks a little bit more comfortable as a runner, seeing the field, processing things faster, hitting the hole, and then, of course, he's, he's able to catch the football, which we all know that he can do. I really like his upside and what he can bring to the offense as another dynamic piece to add. And Boston Scott presenting a change-up role. Uh, we have, and you have, of course, Miles Sanders and uh, Jordan Howard to handle most of the heavy lifting. But I, I think Kenneth Gainwell has sort of gradually improved throughout the summer. And while he might not make a, a massive impact in the early goings, I do think, Josh, that he will start to factor in after the first quarter of the season. Explain to the audience how valuable it is having a guy like Gainwell who can also you know, be split out to play receiver because they were showing on the television broadcast last night instances when he was at Memphis, he was starting the backfield, and they lined him up as a receiver in motion going up against outside corners in college football. So explain the value of having a running back who is that adept at transferring to receiver. Well, it's a lethal weapon because you're really able to get those. Those guys are, are used to running in space, and when the, once they get the ball in their hands, they have a physical dimension to their game where they're used to following people over or, or making cuts in the open field. They just have such a more physical dynamic than a receiver does, and they're just more. They're just so more, so much more dangerous and elusive in the open field, and in many accounts, and just being able to have that flexibility. Uh, and, 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 a, and a screen pass and things like that, that's an extension of the running game. So I think when you add a weapon like that, you saw it's been, he's been compared to Naheem Hines with the Colts. He saw the different matchups that he was able to, to create, uh, matchup nightmares he was able to create with the Colts. And I think you're going to see something similar along those lines uh, with Gainwell here in Philadelphia. It's just having a player that can, do, you know, as a dual purpose back just presents so many different matchups that, for defenses that, and between that and the two tight ends and, and everything else that you have there, if they remain healthy, it's like it's just going to be a very explosive offense. On the defensive side, I did find a few positives, even though that you know they did lose was it thirty five nothing. Obviously, the final scores really matter. It's a preseason game, but I thought Andrew last night was another example of how so much different the Schwartz the Gannon defenses are because it seemed like that what we saw from Singleton and Wilson and Bradley, they were flying over the field, grabbing solo tackles. It seems like, it just feels like every time I watch the Eagles' last two games, Andrew, these linebackers just look better. They look prepared. They look in better position to make plays than they were last year. Yeah, and if there was anyone out there that still thought that Alex Singleton is just a guy and a replacement-level starter, 
I'm pretty sure that even even the skeptics have to be convinced now that he is a legitimate linebacker, legitimate NFL starting linebacker because he has certain traits that you just can't. I mean, they're just innate, right? I mean, like his ability to flow sideline to sideline, his anticipation, his instincts. He could very. He had 120 tackles and 11 starts last season. Now, starting a full slate of games, he could very easily have 175 to 200 tackles if he stays on a similar trajectory, which is amazing to think of. But his skill set keeps developing. He's getting a little bit better in pass coverage, and I think that what he brings as a just downhill player, very physical and tenacious compared to Eric Wilson, who's more of a finesse, fluid linebacker, more uh, with, a, with a, you know, a, vast, a vast coverage acumen and a lot of those different traits, and he's a little bit more rangy. I think that they really complement each other quite well. And then you have T.J. Edwards, who's really taken the next step in his development and broadened his skill set when he was sort of been typecast for the past two seasons as a one-dimensional rundown defender. He had two pass breakups last night, and he looks a little bit more comfortable and adept in coverage. I thought that he's really carving out a, a role and making a case to have a more prominent role on defense. So you have you suddenly have three different linebackers. While they may not all have the highest pedigree, you look at where you found Alex Singleton, T.J. Edwards was undrafted, Eric Wilson was discarded from the Vikings. They have certain traits that I think all – play off each other very well and I think you're you're going to see Jonathan Gannon really put these guys in position to be successful one of the few other guys that looked good last night defensively was the guy that Alex Singleton was asked about Alex Singleton says Milton Williams is a dog we spoke to the media last night and I remember two specific plays last night where Milton Williams completely disrupted the entire Patriots play and one of them they had to hold him on the play because he would have gotten the sack and and put the Patriots back. What is your perspective on Milton Williams after the first few weeks with the Eagles? Just a powerful, versatile defensive lineman that has an ability to really make some noise here in the early or in the early part of the season. He can play defensive end. He can play defensive tackle. He's strong. He moves people off the ball. He's good lateral agility. Uses his hands extremely well. Violent hands. I really think that he looks like a player. It's hard to remind yourself that you have to remind yourself sometimes that he is a rookie because he looks like a savvy veteran in the way that he's able to use his skill set and get upfield and, and, you know, really any, and he's, he showed the ability to anchor. There's a lot to like with Milton Williams. And when he was drafted, I remember there were, it was met. It wasn't necessarily, uh, he wasn't greeted with a, with a fanfare but because it was coming from Louisiana Tech. There's a lot of other players that were more household names, if you will, that were sitting out there. But I was very impressed with Milton Williams in his college, uh, throughout his college career. And I thought that bringing him in where he didn't have to step in and be an immediate contributor, he can play behind Javon Hargrave and Fletcher Cox and be that third defensive tackle and then probably take the reins and assume one of the starting roles next season. I thought this year really allowed him to find his footing in the NFL and maximize his reps and sort of build off that in, in, in the rest throughout his career. So I think I, I, I'm, I think he's going to be a, a really solid player for the Eagles defensive line. Football at four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Andrew DeCheco joining us. Check out his full coverage of the Eagles as well as Jeff Mosher's recap over at InsideTheBirds.com. Andrew, i got to ask you about some of the negatives. Uh, the offensive line, they pretty much had no starters out there last night. The only guy I remember seeing was uh, Sayomalu on the field when I watched and rewatched the game. And I thought that uh, there were some mixed reviews with the offensive line. The first game, I thought the backup lineman looked a little better. But in this game, uh, it seemed like that uh, there were some inconsistencies. There were some missed assignments. It seemed like for a, a group of guys who were fighting for some of the backup spots, I felt that guys like Matt Pryor really didn't do themselves any any uh, any good last night. Yeah, I mean, just off the top of my head, Nate Herbig played all 53 snaps. Uh, certainly behind him was Matt Pryor. I think he played about 46 snaps, so right around there, right around the uh, 90% range. Um, yeah, I mean, these are guys that I, I mentioned Matt Pryor on, on the show, I believe it was last week. He's versatile, but what good is the versatility if you're not – you're not competent at any of those positions, right? If you're hesitant to put a player like Matt Pryor in a, in a game situation, 
you know, I guess it's four years into his career now, then what's the point of stashing him on the back end of the roster when you have a developmental player like a Brett Toth who has shown signs of progression? Not saying that you necessarily feel comfortable putting him in in a game situation either, but there are other players that are that are on the along those lines, like like a Sua Opeta and 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 uh, uh, Driscoll and these type of guys that really have have proven that they're taking the, these nat- these next steps in their natural progression. Where if you got you have a guy like Pryor who's really remained stagnant and not really turned that corner, I think it's time to say goodbye to Matt Pryor um, and and. He just, I mean, and just go with some of these younger guys and work on them and have Jeff, Jeff Stoutland continue to develop them. Second straight week, no catches for Travis Fulgham. He had one target this week, so I guess that's a semi-improvement. I, I, I mentioned earlier the other day, Andrew, you know, it seems like every time I've heard anything about Fulgham, it's Sirianni coaching him up or correcting him. We've pretty much seen almost nothing good out of him, whether it's between camp or these games. Is Travis Fulgham potentially playing his way off this roster? It's uh, 14 snaps, one target. He thought, I, th- I thought that he was going to be inserted towards the back end of, the, of that second quarter. Never happened. And you have to wonder, Josh, what direction the Eagles and Travis Fulgham are headed. They're at a crossroads at a little, a little bit right now because he hasn't had a stellar camp. You have someone like a J.J. Ortega Whiteside who's also vying for that last job, showed a little bit of promise on special teams, which is vital when you're the sixth, fifth or sixth receiver on any roster. You have to have that special teams prowess. I don't know that Travis Fulgham has that. He's sort of been up and down ever since that four-week stretch. You're starting to wonder, was that the outlier or was that the player that he can be at, at his best? We're starting to to look like that's the outlier because he hasn't quite reached that level. There's no Alshon Jeffrey hovering over him now. And you just, all these different guys around him, all these young pieces are putting together, you know, decent camps. And he really hasn't been able to build on his momentum uh, last season. So, I mean, there's, there's, he's running out of time here to really put his stamp on a roll. I still think that he's got an inside track, but his, his stranglehold on that spot is, you know, it's sort of starting to slip away because you have guys like John Hightower and J.J. Ortega Whiteside who just seem hungrier, quite frankly, when they're going out there and running their routes and blocking and, and doing all these and, and doing all these things that you have to do to stand out as a back-end player. And it could ultimately come down to next Friday against the Jets who snags that last spot because if it's, it's that closely contested right now, that it's hard to just say, yeah, you know, Fogel, he's definitely going to be on the roster. I don't think it's that clear cut right now. One guy who may or may not be on the roster to start the season is Andre Dillard. He didn't play again last night. He's been week to week out with an injury. And there's reports out there from Jeff McClain and Matt Lombardo that teams apparently are having conversations with the Eagles about his availability. And there are, quote, a few teams interested uh, but my question, Andrew, is I mentioned this earlier in the week. We saw Greg Little traded. He was the fifth tackle, tackle taken in the 2019 draft. He got a 2022 seventh-round pick. So Dillard, who was the first tackle taken in that draft, what kind of value does he have considering how little he has played? Uh, you have to think it's going to be right around that neighborhood, maybe a six-round pick. But, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so quick to unload Dillard. Right. I mean, you saw what the offensive line looked like last night. The Eagles will be one injury away from uh, for having a guy like a Brett Toth or even a Matt Pryor in there playing that tackle role. And I don't know that that's – I mean, that's a recipe for disaster, of course, but that's how depth, that's how the depth situation is. Like, that's how scary and, and thin it is. You get, your, you get Andre Dillard out of the picture, and then all of a sudden – you know, if something happens, let's say week one or something, and you have Brett Toth in there protecting, um, protecting Jalen Hurts. So that's a scary thought, and I wouldn't. So if I'm the Eagles, you have to you have to assess everything. And I mean, if there's if a team's offering just a six round pick, let's say, I mean, you have to you have to just weigh the pros and cons. I don't know if that makes much sense. Any hopes of a LaRaven Clark, who apparently has uh, been taken off the PUP, him about possibly being one of the backup tackles or? Do you feel like maybe a little bit too little, too late for him? 
Yeah, the Raven Clark's interesting because he he missed a lot of time with injury, and the Eagles don't have much time to evaluate him to be able to make to be to be able to pinpoint what he's able to do. Uh, I, I think when he was signed, Josh, I think what they ultimately wanted him to do was to be that swing tackle, much like Big V was, and, and found success in that role. But I don't know that. I mean, they need to see what they have in him first and make sure that he's fully recovered from his injury, one. And two, that he can play and be a competent reserve should they need him in the event of injury. Time's running out, and, I mean, I don't I don't think you can make that move without knowing what you have in the Raven Clark because certainly Brett Toth, Brett Toth and Matt Pryor aren't the answers if they have to step in for a game or two. He's in the Checo football at four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. He joins us every Tuesday and Friday. He was at the game last night. Check out all of his coverage from the game over at InsideTheBirds.com. Follow him on Twitter at A the Checo NFL. And Andrew, one more thing before I let you go. Um, I need to know how tall you are because the picture of you with Mike K, Mike K is distinctly taller than I expected. So I need to know how tall are you so I can gauge how tall Mike K is. Uh, there's a running joke when people ask me how tall I am. I usually say I'm a shade under five ten, which can, which can mean a lot of things, right? It's it's generalized, but uh, I believe I'm five eight. Okay, so so it's it's not that K is really like super tall. It's just that well, you... he's tall. My, Mike's Mike's tall. Don't get me wrong. He's tall, but I'm also not very tall. So. <laughs> well, I mean, they they say the average male in the United States is five seven and a half. So wh- whatever that's supposed to mean, I don't know. Listen, man. When I was in high school, they, they said I was 5'10". I'd never been 5'10 in my life. So, trust me, I, I, I get it. You know, there's nothing wrong with not being a giant, but it's just I didn't expect Mike K to be that much taller than you. That's all. Yeah, Mike towers over me for sure. Yeah, he's, uh, he's definitely tall. Don't, you know, don't let the picture fool you. I'm just, uh, I'm just, not, so, I, I'm just not super tall. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, obviously... People, people come from all you know shapes and sizes. It's all good. I just thought it was funny because I remember seeing the picture last night. I was like, whoa! Like I, I wasn't expecting that kind of height disparity, but it's all good. Andrew DeCecco at a DeCecco NFL on Twitter. Check out all of his work over at InsideTheBirds.com. He'll be back on Tuesday's edition of the Sports Bash here on 97.3 ESPN. Andrew, great stuff over at Inside the Birds. Keep it up, man. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate that. Have a good one.